Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining the Kirby webinar. Um, we have two speakers today who are both PhD students in the biosecurity program. The first uh, speaker is Siobhan Bhattacharji, who's a Scientia PhD scholar. He's doing an interdisciplinary PhD, um, primarily at the Kirby Institute, but co-supervised across science. His background is as a chemist, and he's working on development of novel materials for personal protective equipment and face mask, masks, including um, materials uh, permeated with graphene and various metal um, nanoparticles. So Siobhan's going to talk to us about his research on developing novel fabrics for masks. Thanks, Siobhan. Thanks, Rana. Uh, I will share my screen now. Uh, hello, everybody. I'd like to begin uh, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and like to pay my respects to elders past and present. In this presentation, uh, I will discuss about graphene, developing graphene and metal nanoparticles coated fabrics, last resort strategies uh, during mask shortages and designing high performing cloth masks. My research project focuses on two key objectives. Number one, developing graphene and metal nanoparticles incorporated novel fabrics for PPE development. And number two, designing a high performing reusable cloth mask as a potential alternative to medical mask. <clears throat> Let's uh, talk about the background. We know uh, PPE, especially protective clothing and face masks, protect the wearer from various health hazards like mechanical, chemical, thermal, and infectious biological, and thus saves from injuries or even death. Um, for the work health safety, PPE is essential um, in various working environment, especially for the frontline workers. There are various types of personal protective clothing that are manufactured with different materials based on hazard type and end user requirement. But despite their protection, conventional protective clothing has some limitations uh, such as heavy, wet, bulky nature, heat stress, low heat dissipation, lack of breathability, and more importantly, inadequate protection against pathogens and hazards. From the picture, we can see a heavy and bulky nature PP for first responders. Okay, let's talk about graphene. Graphene, uh, a two-dimensional single layer planar sheet of carbon atoms, which has already uh, proven itself a groundbreaking nanomaterial uh, nano in diverse technology areas due to its exceptional mechanical thermal, chemical, electrical, and antimicrobial properties. On the other hand, nanoparticles are ultra-fine particles that ranges between one to 100 nanometer in diameter. Metal nanoparticles have a very high surface area, excellent conductivity and antimicrobial activity as well. Here you can see a copper nanoparticle on our developed silk fabrics. This is the scanning electron microscopic image. However, we wanted to come up with a modified textile fabric, which might be the breakthrough over the limitations of the conventional protective clothing, as we said, and import multifunctional activities. And we found that due to the unique properties of graphene and nanoparticles, the fabrics modified by them can be effective to overcome the limitations and import multifunctional properties as shown in the figure. In the figure, we can see graphene and nanoparticles developed uh, fabric, which can have multifunctional activities. However, our first paper on graphene and modified fabrics was published in a high impact journal, Advanced Materials Interface. To develop graphene and metal nanoparticles incorporated cotton and silk fabrics using a coupling agent. We applied several chemical and heat treatment steps as shown in the left figure. So in the right figure, 
there are the photographs of prepared cotton and silk samples. So after the modification, you can see the pure fabrics changes from white to black. Top row are the cotton samples and the bottom row are the silk samples. After preparing the samples, we wanted to characterize them. As shown in the table, the samples were extensively characterized by various spectrometric analysis, such as scanning electron microscopy, mass spectroscopy, Raman spectroscopy, FTIR, XRD, etc. So we did this to identify and confirm the coating of graphene and nanoparticles and evaluate the surface morphology of the developed fabrics. There are some scanning electron microscopic images of the prepared uh, six samples as an example. Here we can clearly see the coating of graphene onto the pure silk and then the coating of nanoparticles on top of uh, the fabrics. The diameter of the nanoparticles was 70 to 75 nanometer, whereas uh, the thickness we found, the thickness of the graphene uh, coating was found uh, 45 to 55 nanometer. Here are some spectra of FTIR Raman XPS, which confirms the graphene and nanoparticles coating onto the cotton fabric and the silk fabrics. So due to the time limitation, actually, I will not go deep into these characterization parts. <clears throat> However, after characterization, uh, we assisted the activity, the multifunctional activity of our developed fabrics. From the figure, we can see our developed cotton fabric showed excellent water resistance. Here we can see on the top figure and on the left figure, we can see uh, the water droplets are absorbed within the cotton surface within seven seconds, whereas uh, the last one, the copper modified uh, copper and graphene coated fabrics, even after 90 seconds, the water, doublet, uh, water drop layers were still the same. That means it has high water resistance. And it also showed high, uh, I mean, low surface resistivity. That means high electroconductivity, low thermal and mechanical stability, and UV protection ability. The graphene and copper modified samples showed excellent washing durability, even after washing 20 times. Moreover, these fabrics showed excellent electrothermal activity. The figures show the fabric's thermal images. Uh, when electricity passes through the fabric, the temperature increases, you can see from the picture. Uh, it proves uh, its potential to be used as a smart textile, a smart wearable textile, actually. Um, our paper on graphene and nanoparticles coated cotton has been published in a prestigious, very high impact journal, Carbon. Uh, like cotton, our graphene and nanoparticles coated steel fabrics showed excellent multifunctional activity, such as uh, high water resistance, high conductivity, UV protectivity, high electrothermal activity, uh, which is shown in the figure E, we can see. So we captured thermal images using, using the infrared cameras. The developed fabric uh, actually sustained its activity even after washing 20 times, similar to the cotton. And compared to the other samples, samples incorporated with graphene and copper showed the best performance. Our this paper was published um, in a high impact Willy journal, Advanced Materials Interface. Okay, um, let's talk about the antimicrobial activity of our developed fabrics. Protection against pathogens with Personal protective clothing is essential. Um, concerns uh, over the emerging bio threats and outbreak of the infectious disease underscores the need for the antimicrobial and biocompatible protective clothing to protect people uh, in different working environments. From the figure, we can see our developed cotton and silk fabrics showed almost 99% inhibition activity against gram-negative E. coli and Pseudomonas originosa, and 80 to 99 percent inhibition against gram-positive bacteria Staphylococcus aureus. 
the samples retain its excellent antimicrobial activity even after washing five and 10 times. Moreover, the fabric showed remarkable activity against uh, Candida albicans fungi and low cytotoxicity than the pure samples, suggesting its good biocompatibility, which is very important uh, for the clothing. <clears throat> Figures show the ACM images of the antimicrobial activity and schematic of the potential uh, um, antimicrobial activity and mechanisms. We can see a significantly fewer bacteria in the modified samples in comparison to the pure fabrics. The graphene and nanoparticles inhibit microorganisms by inhibiting protein synthesis, nucleic acid synthesis, inhibiting cell wall synthesis, and restricting their metabolism system. One of our paper, uh, actually, we, no, actually we submitted a paper which is under review on the antimicrobial activity. Let's talk about uh, aim number two now, cloth mask. During the COVID-19, uh, due to the worldwide shortages of uh, medical masks and respirators, the use of homemade cloth masks has become an alternative as a last resort. It is essential to understand the key performance factors of the mask and respirators and evidence on cloth mask materials. So we studied optimal design features, decontamination methods, and evidence on cloth mask materials. And we found that filtration efficiency, fit, fluid resistance, number of filter layers, breathing resistance, sweat count are the key performance factors. Based on the studies reported on the performance of the various uh, fabrics, commonly available fabrics, uh, we recommended a cloth mask made up at least three layers, uh, which is shown in the figure below. And adding a nylon stocking layer over the mask for a better fit. The general community might also uh, need to decontaminate and reuse the uh, disposable and single use devices as a last resort. So we also reviewed the decontamination method as shown in the table. Among the methods, UV radiation, hydrogen peroxide vapor and moist heat are the most promising. However, decontamination and reuse are not recommended as they can deteriorate the fit and minimize the filtration efficiency. Our article on last resort strategies during the mask shortages has been published in BNG Open Respiratory Research. However, uh, though there are some studies on the performance of cloth masks, there was actually no experimental evidence of designing an effective cloth mask evaluating all dimensions of protection, such as the respiratory droplet blocking efficiency, especially um, sneeze, which is uh, the violent event, um, water resistance, breathing resistance, et cetera. So to address the gap, uh, for the first time we performed a comprehensive study testing the respiratory droplet blocking efficiency generated during a human sneeze water resistance, uh, washability, breathability of different uh, layers and combinations of the fabrics to design an effective cloth mask. So we purchased um, 17 different um, types of commonly available fabrics of varying composition, porosity, and thread count. Uh, thread count is a number of thread per square inch of the fabric and porosity is the percentage uh, of the pores in the fabric. Here, there are some scanning electron microscopic images of various fabric samples, um, which is showing the microscopic structures and the pores of the fabrics that we studied. Then we made the mask. Uh, the mask were made by uh, following the CDC recommended uh, quick cut no seal method. And then we challenged the prepared mask um, against 
things of a uh, healthy volunteer. Uh, figure A shows a um, few representative uh, images of the droplet blocking capability of a single layer face mask, two layer face mask, and three layer face mask. Um, we found that increasing the uh, number of layers significantly increases the droplet blocking efficiency on an average by 20 times per additional fabric layer. When we checked uh, the water resistance capacity of the fabrics, uh, which is very important um, uh, for determining the optimal position of different fabrics uh, in a cloth mask, here you can see cotton and linen has very low water resistance as water droplets absorb within few seconds rapidly whereas the nylon and polyester has high water resistance. After that, uh, we measured the breathing resistance of the best perform three layer combinations, um, which was within the limit of the standard value. However, we recommended uh, overall, uh, we recommended a uh, minimum of three layers is necessary to resemble the droplet blocking performance of a surgical mask. And um, we recommended a combination of cotton and linen as inner layer, as we show in the figure, uh, blends in the middle layer, and polyester nylon in the outer layer, which, is, uh, which exhibited the best performance among all indicators tested. In an optimum three layer design, the average thread count uh, should be greater than uh, 200, of course, and the porosity should be less than 2%. Furthermore, we did the machine washing of the fabrics. And we found that the machine washing at 60 degree uh, Celsius did not significantly impact the performance of the cloth mask. Actually, it increased their properties uh, a little bit uh, because of the shrinkage of the fabric reduces the pore sizes. So these findings, we think these findings inform the design of high performing homemade cloth mask. Our uh, cloth mask paper uh, recently was published uh, in ACS, ACS Biomaterial Science and Engineering, and the press released uh, our paper. <clears throat> Overall, it can be said that um, our developed uh, multifunctional fabrics have the potential to solve the drawbacks of the existing PPE and can save many lives in Australia and worldwide. Moreover, our research on cloth mask provides a blueprint for a well-designed cloth mask uh, that can outperform a three-layer surgical mask. We think these results uh, can assist people in preparing effective homemade cloth mask uh, during ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and the future pandemics as well. I'd like to express um, my special thanks and gratitude to my supervisors, Professor Raina McIntyre, Dr. Rakesh Joshi, Dr. Abrar Chiptai, and Associate Professor David Heslop. I also want to thank uh, others mentioned here for their support in different various experiments uh, during my studies. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Siobhan. Uh, we might move straight on to Valentina's presentation and then come back for questions, just to make sure that Valentina gets enough time. Um, <clears throat> so our next presentation is Valentina Costantino, who is about to submit her PhD. Um, she's doing a PhD on mathematical modeling to inform control of epidemic infectious diseases. Thank you, Valentina. Thank you, Raina. So um, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you um, for joining this seminar. Uh, I would like to acknowledge um, that this presentation has been held on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people and the traditional owner and custodian of this land. And I would like to pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. Okay, so uh, as Raina said, my PhD, um, Research has been focusing on using of mathematical. Oh, your the volume digits. has gone, um, Valentina. Can I say maybe I would just, I would just do this one second. A bit. I've turned it up. Okay, one second. We can hear you now. 
can, can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me now? Ah, okay. So, um, as Raina was saying, my PhD has been focusing on using mathematical modeling in support to the optimization of public health decision making and intervention for the infectious disease control. Um, so, uh, also, like the burden of infectious diseases um, has decreased substantially uh, since the 1980s with the peak of the HIV transmission. Uh, we live in a world now uh, where uh, it's way more globalized than before, and this places a further challenge when dealing with infectious disease outbreak containment. In fact, aspects like uh, population growth, urbanization, which increase the population density, the increased traveling and, mo and movements of people is constantly the uh, and constantly the increase of the livestock production are only some of the reasons why the current world is experiencing an increase of emerging infectious disease. And those diseases spread more rapidly than before. Um, on the other hand, uh, advance, advances in medical care and the progressive decrease in birth rate, I will, I will add, are generating an older population and an increase of like immunosuppression condition, which makes the population more susceptible and a risk of more severe outcome from contracting an infectious diseases. Another aspect to take in consideration is that um, the possibility now to develop artificial engineering pathogens as well to put like a further increase uh, the risk for the global biosecurity. So going back where we started, yes, it's true that the burden of infectious diseases is decreased in the last few decades. However, like the condition we live now are the perfect recipe for each new outbreak to become a pandemic. With of course, the most appropriate example made from the current COVID-19 pandemic, which we are dealing for nearly two years, which for, um, this further highlights that like, the preparedness for an outbreak response now, we need to integrate capability in rapid modeling of intervention effectiveness with the development of mathematical tools that can be used actually in real time. Um, then we need to build appropriate surveillance system to collect detailed population characteristic data sets, which um, will let to speed up the resources prioritization to targeted group based on the characteristic of the infected population. Lastly, when informing policy making for this, the results need to be therefore constantly updated following all the pathogen evolution in time, which of course they change all the time. Giving this general background, um, this, is, um, this is like the central body of my data which uses mathematical modeling and risk analysis to optimize public health responses based on available resources. And the aspect we deal with are from diseases of concern like smallpox in the case of a re-emergent infectious disease, seasonal influenza, which is a recurrent infection, COVID-19, which is a the emergent infection uh, disease, and the focus is in draw results, which take into consideration important population characteristics, as we say, like age-specific contact rates, immunosuppression, age-specific infectivity and susceptibility. So in these cases are modeled like pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical interventions. And um, yes, and all the four chapters have been published. But um, following, I just want to show some results we got for controlling the current COVID-19 pandemic with no pharmaceutical intervention. So on the left in this slide is a study that uh, looked at the effectiveness of travel ban restrictions to control the spread of COVID-19 using, using the particular example of the travel ban that Australia implemented for travel from China. Uh, during the, and after the peak in China, the first peak. While on the right is uh, one of the many studies I did with Raina that looked at um, the impact of universal mask use on COVID-19 spread. And we took as the example the uh, Victoria second wave of COVID. 
Um, I will go a little bit more in particular um, in details, uh, starting with the, with the travel uh, ban study. So a little bit of background. So in response to the epidemic, uh, Australia implemented the 1st of February 2020, a travel ban from people coming from China, just before the disease incident peaked in China, which was the 5th of February. The risk of a person coming here infected from China, as we know, like from any country, but in, in this particular case from China, is proportional to the volume of the travel from the affected country and, of course, the prevalence of the infection that they have there at that time point. So we aim to estimate the affected cases from the implemented travel ban to China and explore the impact of lifting the ban as was planned at the time, which was the 8th of March, um, in two different scenarios, when lifting totally for everyone to come in or partially, which means allowing just students um, to come in. So this study has um, two steps. So the first step, we estimated the number of infected people coming into Australia from China every two weeks. Then used those numbers uh, to, um, into a modified SCIR model to project the estimated epidemic curve in each scenario. Um, so firstly, to estimate the number of infected people coming from China, we used the 2019 AIDS travel passenger data from China to Australia, which were available at the ABS website, and the epidemiological data set of confirmed cases from COVID-19 in China, which was published from WHO. However, we consider with the notification being only 10% of the real number of infected people at the time in China due to underreporting, mild cases, and more of everything as asymptomatic infection that we didn't have the knowledge we have now at that time. This, as in, this assumption is based on the study and a study from Japan, which estimated that only 9.2% of cases in China were notified at, or detected at that time. So in um, this, um, the graph on the left uh, shows so like in the notification cases in red, which uh, China was reporting, and the blue line is the probable number of real notification, uh, like of real cases. Then we fitted the estimated blue curve between the 5th and the 23rd of February with the Poisson regression model to forecast the number of infected arrivals over time. And this is shown in the figure on the right. So the blue line is the last bit of the estimation of cases in China. And the red line is the model fitting at full testing. Um, so, uh, exploring the results, um, the table on the left shows the number of estimated infected people coming into Australia from China every two weeks. And those are the numbers that aliment then the model epidemics in each scenario, which results are shown in the figure on the right. While, um, like lifting the band fully or partially didn't make much difference, as the incidence at the time around 8th of March was low. At, uh, and so, um, but however, like we can see that without those five weeks ban, the situation would have been much worse as shared in the graphs on the right. We can see a little bump in the incidence when opening the border uh, in cases like the blue line, but, um, but not enough to regenerate the outbreak as you can see uh, from the graph. So in conclusion uh, from this uh, research paper, we estimated that the travel ban reduced the total cases and deaths by about 85%. This analysis has been a first insight into the effectiveness of travel restriction and COVID-19 at the break, and actually supported the effectiveness of the Australian response at the time. And the model can be used, can, can be generalized, so can be used to inform gradually lifting or putting bands or replacing with new bands for international containment of COVID-19 and national as well. So going to uh, the other paper that I wanted to show, I will give a little bit of background on the, the other article that we published, which is 
like um, so the Australian response as we know firstly focused on contact tracing but the problem is that asymptomatic infection and pre-symptomatic transmission have made challenging to identify potentially infectious people and the universal mask use as a policy was implemented. Indeed, the effectiveness of mask use during periods of high transmission has been shown to be effective. However, the rule, the rule of uptake of mask effectiveness, of timing during an epidemic of starting to wear masks is unknown. In this study, so we have to estimate the impact of universal community face mask in Victoria, along with other routine disease control in place in like lockdown at the time there was on in Victoria, et cetera. So for this study, a modified SCIR model was built to simulate, to simulate the epidemic curve in Victoria between the 1st of June and the 1st of October, um, 2020. The, the model accounted for lockdown, contact tracing, case finding, and we showed results with and without mask use in, in varied scenarios. So the lockdown reduced the mobility and contact has been modeled following the results from a modeling study that was published in US, which looked at the association between modeling uh, mobility patterns and COVID-19 transmission. Um, so uh, the model case incidents was fitted to the notification data in that period, which is the 1st of June, about the 20th of July, and it's showed in the figure on the left. The red line is the daily new cases data, and the blue line is the model fit to the data. We modeled the effect of the stage three lockdown, which started 9th of July 2020, lasting for six weeks until the 20th of August 2020. The figures on the left so show the curve with no mask. And as you can see, the epidemic curve increases just again after about 10 days from the end of the six weeks lockdown. So lockdown alone is not enough to control the epidemic. While the figure on the right shows the effect of timing in implementing the universal mask use, and uh, we use like the mask in the base case scenario are considered to be 67% effective. And we consider at least 70% of people using them in a, in a, when a, a universal mask use policy is implemented. So on the, on the, on the red line, so the red line shows uh, on the figures on the right, the red line shows results with mask use implemented from the 23 of July, which is exactly what was done. While the blue line shows results in the case the universal mask use policy was implemented since July 1st. So as you can see, starting the mask use 23 days before would have made a big difference in cumulative cases and deaths by the end of the second wave in Victoria. So in conclusion, um, what was showed in this study is that the lockdown and contact tracing may be not be enough to control an outbreak. The impact uh, to have an impact must effective at least 67% needs to be used at least from 50% of the population. And finally, we estimated the community mask effectiveness during the second wave in Victoria to be only around 11%. Um, so uh, early mask use should be implemented as soon community transmission is detected, which makes the greater difference and which we didn't do either this time. Um, so following uh, some takeaway recommendation that um, generated from my PhD thesis, uh, accounting for all the limitation we encountered and we went through. So like what I was uh, recommending at the end of this study is that improved surveillance system for data collection linked to host information and make them publicly available is uh, uh, it's very important. And this will allow for a better estimation of age-specific epidemiological parameters, as well as enable 
uh, the inclusion of host behavioral dynamics into models to produce a more accurate representation of reality. And this will also enable models to better inform preparedness response. Then we need to standardize and uh, uh, the modeling practice because um, standardized modeling practice are required to understand the precision of a model forecast and estimation. So the constantly increasing use of modeling to inform policies demands a standardization of methods so that we can compare the results in different scenarios as well. And this will facilitate as well policy makers in apply the results coming from these mathematical modeling studies. Because modeling is becoming more and more complex to include human behavior and population characteristic and culture, this is the need of more interdisciplinary collaboration. And this could include sociology, psychology fields like uh, to better reproduce the reality again and consequently better targeted at break responses. And lastly, which is the most important thing, I think modeling results need to be constantly updated as the population, the host, the evolution of the virus is constantly changing. Um, that's my presentation. Thank you to everyone for listening. And a big thank you goes to my two supervisors, Raina McIntyre and Richard Gray. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Valentina. So um, we might um, open up the Q&A now. There's a question for Siobhan from Virginia. Great presentation. Can you comment on the likely cost of the different fabrics and coatings? Um, actually, uh, we did uh, experiments uh, in the laboratory basis with very uh, small fabric samples. So uh, I think uh, I think the materials uh, we used is not very uh, high cost. But we need to do more experiments or, or I think uh, we need to do more study to know uh, like, uh, uh, or like some industrial uh, uh, manufacturing or, or manufacturing with a small pilot plant basis, uh, at, least, uh, uh, at least a face mask or any PPE to know the amount of uh, materials is needed. Uh, so I think in future, I will uh, will know, I think. Thank you. Um, just um, put your chat, your questions into the Q&A box and um, we can ask Valentina and Siobhan to answer them. Valentina, I had a question for you. What about the Delta variant? If we're uh, applying those models to the Delta variant, how do you think it would look? Say the mask modeling, for example. Uh, you're muted, Valentina. Okay. So like, I, I personally think that like, as we showed with the, with the variant, which was the first one, which is like way less transmissible and way less infective. Um, I, I think like, as we showed with us now, that mask use should be implemented like next to every single policy we make because they are like they're very effective i think in the same time like this means that for the delta variant this should be a policy implemented for the start of any of each community transmission as soon as we detect community transmission because as we showed before like it, the important thing is timing. Like it's one of the most important things is timing, especially with an R0 that is two, three times higher, the timing will be like shrink. So like we need to we need to act much faster. And I think mask use, especially like a little bit more effective as well, should be uh, should be in every single like um, settings uh, used and. And even like, as we know, it, it's gonna be very, very hard to control this virus with this Delta variant with the, with the vaccine. It's like reaching herd immunity is gonna be very hard. So um, I don't think it's possible. So like we will need in settings like this, we will need to use masks, yeah. Thanks. Um, I can see that Kevin Ehrman, who I think is from Ascend Technologies, who we're working with on some mask work is, 
online. If you do, you do have a question for Siobhan, Kevin? <laughs> Putting you on the spot at late at night. You can type your question in if you do. Thanks. Um, any other questions? I mean, I guess um, while we're waiting for people to think about their questions, another question, Valentina, is about vaccination. Um, and again, about the Delta variant, you know, what's your estimate of the R0 of the Delta variant? Do you think it could be as high as seven or eight? Um, and how, you know, I know you're doing some work on that now. How is that going to change our um, ability to control the disease in the community? I saw like, um, I saw some, some estimates like which uh, the R0 is uh, like uh, likely to be five plus for the Delta variant. So uh, I don't know if he is going to get to eight. But I even think like uh, with more we go and we learn, like the idea that we will like diminish in the sense of like us responding to it. So like at the start, yeah, I think it's gonna be like five, set, between five and seven. Um, and the ability of us to respond is like, has been like, if we, if we consider this as this zero and we consider that the vaccine is actually less effective to us, which like has been estimated to be around 60, uh, 60 to 80 percent the good the Pfizer one after two doses. So that means that like you need like to vaccinate around 98, 100 percent of the population to to reach herd immunity. So I think uh, the chances with this virus is like we will vaccinate as high as, as we can. And then, like, we will need to deal with that using all the no pharmaceutical intervention. Like, we will probably will be keeping doing, like, definitely contact tracing, but, like, it must use and social distancing when the outbreak or hot spots or we are in close environment. I think that's the way to go now, unfortunately. Thanks, Valentina. Um, the next question is from Professor Tony Kelleher. How broadly used do you think mask wearing should be? And do you think it's acceptable within households? I might ask both of you to answer that. Um. I, I think personally, like it is, it is uh, like, I mean, I had my parents that like half of my family has been infected and the other half living together didn't. Um, they, they used mask in, in the house. So I think it's, highly effective and i think should be a policy of using of course masking when you have like cases in your household um in the same time um i think outside uh in open environment there are not many evidence of like uh, sharing for example the virus is opening a ventilated environment i don't see that so I think like definitely I don't, I'm not supporting, like I'm not in support of a policy where you have masks 24 hours a day, wherever you go. But again, like I think it's common sense of people as well. Like you are close two meters or in a crowded place, you wear a mask. Yeah, like outside you don't wear a mask. Like definitely I think we can't wear a mask 24 hours a day because it hurts our throat and, and it's not healthy. But in the same time, you need to choose where to wear it. Like, like uh, definitely in the house with cases, yeah. Outside in an open environment, I don't see the necessity for now. Thanks, Valentina. Um, and Tony had an additional comment there saying the motivation for the question is the spread in southwestern Sydney where there appears to be a lot of spread within households. And, of course, we've heard from the chief health officer that 100% of household contacts are getting infected. Um, uh, there's a question now from um, Kevin Ehrman from Ascend. The visualization of bacteria was an interesting way to measure the effectiveness of the bioefficacy. Did you correlate these pictures to more traditional log reduction methods? And we, um, I have to acknowledge Rowena Bull as well, um, who um, allowed Siobhan to do some work in, in her lab with her um, team. So thanks, Rowena. Oh, thanks, Kevin. Thanks for the question. 
Uh, actually, uh, we did uh, uh, the scanning electron microscopic images uh, just to show its effectiveness. Uh, we didn't measure uh, the bio uh, effectiveness or antimicrobial activity by using these um, images. So we actually didn't correlate those pictures uh, to more traditional log reduction methods. But could you do that, Siobhan? Uh, actually, from a representative small sample, you can't measure the whole uh, fabric's effectiveness. So, so we already showed uh, the antimicrobial activity with different methods uh, in the laboratory. We didn't, but we didn't use that uh, log reduction uh, technique. Okay. Um, another question from Virginia: How accessible are the models? Is there a risk model? Is there a risk? Is there a risk model uh, being replicated? Not quite sure. That's for Valentina. How accessible are the models? Uh, sorry, say again. I was not. I was. Uh, what is the question? How accessible are the models? Yeah, so that's that's the goal. So like uh, the, the goal for me is one of the most important things that is that, as I say, we need to have like real time use, usable tools and they have to be fairly simple. So they're like uh, the majority of people can use them. Like my models are pretty simple. Like they are based on SCR model and like they are, they run like there is a, a like a, a table of parameters that you can change and 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 run the model and and get results so like they are definitely generalized you need to change all the parameters for the population infected and the population under study and of course the disease under study so transmissibility infectivity r zero uh, all the parameters the uh, duration of infection latency etc as well as age distribution, age specific contact, and our like population characteristics. But once you have this data, yeah, you can use and apply the models to different diseases and different population and the study as well. So Dr. it's definitely totally generalized, yeah. Valentina, maybe Virginia is asking, is the code publicly accessible? And the answer is no, but- I uh, know. You have very detailed supplementary materials on with all the equations and the yeah. and trying the model structure. So anyone, so all, all the equation, yeah, anyone can visit. It. Like I mean, from all the equation of the models they run on, they are all published in the supplementary material as well as all the parameters used um, and the diagrams flow charts as well. So it's like it, from from the uh, from the paper uh, published and the supplementary material you can reproduce very easy like if you have a knowledge of MATLAB or R or yeah okay thanks um just one more comment in relation to Tony's question um I was involved in a study in China very early on in the pandemic where uh, we showed that wearing a mask in the household significantly reduced the risk of infection, but you had to be wearing it before the first case developed symptoms. Um, and that's, of course, because of all the importance of pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic transmission, that the peak uh, viral load is before the symptoms start. So, yeah. And, and the other things as well is the way, because you know, we, we say like 70% of people wearing masks, but it's like, it's the way people wear masks. As you can see when you walk in the streets, people wear masks like with the nose outside or like without masks outside. So that's, that's the other issue there. Like you can have a 76%, 67% effective masks and then wear it not properly, it's zero. Mm. Um, Siobhan, I don't know if you've got your ACS video handy, but that might be worth uh, the last paper that Siobhan mentioned was um, published in one of the Ast American Chemistry Society journals, which is uh, which and they put out a they did a video on it, um, which explains. So basically what that paper does through a range a series of experimental studies done in collaboration with Pratik Bal from engineering um, is that uh, is a blueprint for the design of a cloth mask that can actually outperform a surgical mask. So um, if you've got the video handy, Siobhan, do you? Um, 
Yeah, I'm searching the YouTube. Yes. Screen and that would be a good way to finish. While we're waiting for that, I might just apologize for my oversight of not acknowledging the traditional owners of the land at the start. And I would thank Siobhan and Valentina for, for doing that. Um, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land of where I am, it's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respect to elders past and present and any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people watching today. Were you able to find that video, Siobhan? Uh, yeah. We might just finish the, um, I think there's no more questions. You might just, here it is, I found it. I can share my screen and show it to you. Yeah. I don't know if Elaine is allowing me to share my screen, but I'll try. Uh. Yeah. Sorry. During the COVID-19 pandemic, cloth face masks became a way to help protect yourself and others from the virus. And for some people, they became a fashion statement with many fabrics and patterns to choose from. But just how effective are they, especially in containing a sneeze? Now, researchers reporting in ACS Biomaterials Science and Engineering have used high-speed videos of a person sneezing to identify the best cloth face mask design. Early in the pandemic, worldwide shortages of surgical masks and N95 respirators led many people to make or purchase cloth face masks. Now, with safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines available, mask restrictions are easing in many states. However, face masks will likely still be required in certain settings for a while, especially with possible vaccine-resistant variants emerging. They might also be useful in future pandemics. Cloth face masks are made of tiny intertwined fibers. Although SARS-CoV-2 is too small to be trapped by most fabrics, it often travels in much larger droplets expelled from the nose and mouth when a person speaks, coughs, or sneezes. Fortunately, cloth masks can help block these droplets. A few studies have examined the best fabrics to do this, but until now, none have been conducted under the explosive conditions of a real human sneeze. Siobhan Bhattacharji, Raina McIntyre, and colleagues wanted to see how well masks of various fabrics and multiple layers blocked respiratory droplets from the sneezes of a healthy adult. The researchers made simple face masks with 17 commonly available fabrics, including different widths and thread counts of cotton, polyester, nylon, and blends, shown magnified here. Each mask had one, two, or three layers of the same or different fabrics. A healthy 30-year-old volunteer put on each mask, tickled the inside of his nose with tissue paper on a cotton swab, and then readjusted the mask right before he sneezed. The researchers captured high-speed videos of the sneezes and computed the intensity of droplets in the images in a region two centimeters from his mouth. With each fabric layer, the droplet blocking capability improved by more than 20 times. Interestingly, all of the three-layer cloth combinations the researchers tested were more effective than a three-layer surgical mask. The best masks for blocking droplets contained a hydrophilic or water attracting inner layer of cotton or linen, an absorbent middle layer of a cotton polyester blend, and a water repelling or hydrophobic outer layer of polyester or nylon. Machine washing the masks didn't decrease their performance. In fact, masks containing cotton or polyester worked slightly better after washing because their pores shrank. The researchers are now planning studies with more people and different age groups. Sorry, I'm just having trouble switching that off. Um, if there's no more questions, um, I'd like to thank Siobhan and Valentina for their presentations and also Tony Kelleher for um, providing us with the facilities to set up the aerosol dynamics lab where um, that work was done. Um, it's really generated a huge amount of work that's been very influential in the pandemic and um, and Valentina's work has been hugely influential. It's been covered in the media, including in Samoa, where she did some modelling on measles and COVID in Samoa. So thank you, um, everyone, and uh, we'll see you again next week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Rana. Thank you. Thanks, Rana. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.